Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining another edition here. I'm really excited to have my good friend, Dr. Jason Yeager on the, uh, on the show with us today. Jason, how are you doing today? Doing great, Dr. Kirk. It's really great to see. It's been a long time, but man, you yeah. have not changed. Well, I mean, neither of you, man, I tell you, I think that's the chiropractic lifestyle like we were talking about, you know, when you're doing nutrition and supplements and everything and doing what you love too. I think that's a really important thing. I know when I wasn't doing what I loved before I got into chiropractic, I felt like I was aging very rapidly and I was eating junk food. I was teaching school, teaching junior high school. So it was really stressful and I was eating junk food and all this stuff. And I felt like I was aging a lot faster then. So, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Well, let me introduce you to everybody who's, uh, who's watching right now. So Dr. Dr. Yeager and I, we went to school together at, uh, it was LACC back then now at Southern California University of Health Sciences. Gosh, it's been 20 years, you know, 21 years since we, I mean, actually we first met in New College back in 1995. Yeah, that's is, true. Doing our prereqs. So uh, since then, Dr. Yeager, he uh, presently works in a unified medical, physical therapy, and chiropractic multi-state group. He has previously served as a board member for the Nevada Chiropractic Physicians Regulatory Board, the Nevada Chiropractic Council, as well as the Nevada Chiropractic Association. Currently, he serves as the co-chair for the International Chiropractors Association's Applied Sciences Committee. He's a certified fellow and instructor in the technique of chiropractic biophysics, which we're going to get into during our talk today, uh, and is the developer of the universal tractioning system. He's a medically published author and lectures on chiropractic around the U.S. and internationally. Dr. Yeager is licensed to practice chiropractic in Nevada, Idaho, and California, and is proud to bring his experience and knowledge to the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners. And when I was looking at your, at your uh, CV, I got to tell you, it was absolutely amazing, Jason, all the stuff you've been doing. Uh, Dr. Scringe was on with me last week, and we were talking about you, too. Just amazing, because you've always been so humble and, and just, you know, just a great uh, all-around guy. And to see you do so well and have all these published papers is really fantastic. Wow, I really appreciate that. Well, yeah, as you said, we both went to school at, at LACC, now Southern California University of Health Sciences. And I actually had a chance, uh, it's been about two years now, to go down and, and tour the campus and look at, at what they've done new and different. Dr. Skrin yes. gave us personal tour and we got to hang out and visit with him. Of course, he's, he's the, uh, the head honcho over there now. He's the prez, right. but mm -hmm. he was one of our instructors, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know we were talking about one of the different things they have there now is they have air conditioning in the clinic. <laughs> you remember when we were in the student clinic, and we didn't have AC in the summer. We had the shirt and tie and the coat on and it was like 105 degrees and you're dripping sweat while you're seeing patients. It was, it was kind of wild. Yeah. Yeah. You know, California, you, you think it's that beautiful 70 degree weather, but you have to be yeah. right down there on the coast yep. and you move inland where we were in Whittier and, and it, it can get as hot as it is where I am in Vegas. Absolutely. And then you get a little humidity too. So it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not that dry heat. Correct. <laughs> so Jason, what I want to do, I want, I want people to understand like, you know, my followers know my story of why I got into chiropractic and it saved me from surgery when I was 16 for, for football, where that was what they wanted to do was to take out my discs, fuse them together. I was told I was never going to play sports again. And then I'd be in pain for the rest of my life. And I'd be on opioids pretty much for the rest of my life. So that was my story. And a chiropractor, Dr. Marty, Marty Gallegos saved me from that fate. And I went on to play high school ball and did well and played college as well. What's your story? What got you into chiropractic? What made you move in this direction? Well, thanks for asking because it, it, it's an interesting uh, hard right turn. Uh, growing up in Las Vegas, uh, I, I played all the sports in high school that you typically play, but I also really got into extreme sports. So yeah. skiing, water skiing, snowboarding, cliff jumping. Uh, I was a lifeguard at Wet n Wild on the Las Vegas Strip and we got <laughs> to do some fun and crazy things there. Well, Fast forward, the next thing is that I get a job at the Excalibur Hotel as a jousting sword fighting knight. Uh, you know, so yeah. while a lot of my best friends were, you know, doing construction or waiters or, or, or whatever kind of, kind of, you know, typical job that you do as a young person, uh, I, I was swinging a broadsword. So right. <laughs> I was on my way to work one night. It was actually Thanksgiving evening. And uh, I, I was driving my, my truck down um, Flamingo Road and getting close to the strip. And this, this little old guy pulls across the lane in a Gran Torino and then stops in lane one, which is where I'm doing about 45 miles an hour. I crash into that front axle of his car. And, and I mean, I, I saw stars. He had to see stars. And both of our, our vehicles were demolished. Uh, a police officer sees the whole thing. 
gets our vehicles towed away, makes sure we're okay. And then I hop in the police vehicle and they take me to the strip to the Excalibur Hotel where I go and I, I sword fight out two more shows. Well, I wake up the next day and I can't move. And, and so, you know, what, what does a young guy do when he's scared and in a ton of pain and doesn't know what to do? What, what would you right. do? Yeah, I, I called my yeah. mommy. I didn't know, right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. and so mom says, we're going to take you to see a chiropractor. And, I, and then I was like, I was already hurting and, and, and emotional. And then I'm really scared because, oh, my gosh, they're going to crack my neck. And right. I had no idea what it was. I right. had no idea what was going to happen. And, and I said, no. And, and she said, oh, yes, you will. And then I knew that tone. So my, a couple of my buddies from the show, they had to come and pick me up out of bed. I, I couldn't move. And, and every bump in the road and pothole on the way to the chiropractor's office uh, was a new sensation and pain I'd never experienced in my whole life. So yeah. uh, they carry me in Dr. Stephanie Youngblood's office. She's a, a very very famous and well-respected chiropractor in the nation. Yeah, I've heard of her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and Dr. Stephanie says, we're going to figure out what's going on and we're going to take some x-rays of you. And after she looks at everything, she says, there's, there's no curve in your neck. Your neck is supposed to be shaped like this and, and your neck is like this. And from the whiplash that you went through, right. that likely was the thing that, that damaged the neck and why you're in pain. And your brain communicates down through, through your neck and to every element of your spine and muscle and organ and tissue and no wonder you're hurting so bad so she says we're going to do chiropractic on you and we're going to do these things called adjustments and we're going to put your bones back into alignment and we're going to we're going to fix you we're going to bring you back to new so fast forward when when i was done with my care plan a few months later i felt better than i did before i had gotten in the car crash i mean yeah. it was incredible mm -hmm. But of interest, I said, well, you, you told me my neck looked like this and it was supposed to be like this and you've been doing this to me. Uh, let's do a new x-ray. Let's look at the, at the data, the objective evidence. Right. And, uh, and we did, and my neck still looked like that. Right, yeah. So, so I, I was trying to connect why I felt better, but I, I wasn't better. The, the problem didn't seem to have been corrected. So, um, that was the beginnings of me looking into chiropractic. I was in a pre-law degree. Wow. <laughs> uh, and so I, I looked around the country and I looked at where I wanted to go and where I wanted to live. And I wanted evidence-based training and I wanted to be right. in a well-respected school. And, and that's why I chose Southern California University of Health Sciences. Yeah, that's an awesome. That's an awesome story, and I think that makes it powerful when you're, you know, when you've gone through it. It's a, it's, it's really different than just learning it with books. When you've had the whiplash, when you've had the headache, and know how bad it is, especially with being young. I know I got hit by a uh, police officer who ran a red light at speed. They estimate between seventy-five and eighty miles an hour and T-boned me when I was a senior in college in nineteen ninety-three, and uh, I came out. No physical scratches, but severe uh, whiplash and concussion and got to where I couldn't even write a paper. And people were like, oh, you're young. You should be fine. And the insurance company, of course, oh, two weeks. You should be, you should be better. No problem. But when you've gone through it, you really know what it's like. And it gives you a different purpose with trying to, to help other people out there. And I think that's fascinating. You bring, bring up the fact that you felt better, but your curvature was still the same. And I see this a lot in my office, too, when we, we have a patient who Let's say they had a, an accident even 20 years ago, and not only is their spine straight, but now it's even a reverse curve to where it's the opposite. So getting into that, like what is it that you're doing with, because a lot of people for them, hearing a chiropractic biophysics is relatively new to them. They don't really understand what's the difference. So how would you describe the difference between what you're doing with chiropractic biophysics and what say just traditional adjustments, traditional chiropractic does? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, chiropractic biophysics, uh, it's a technique, we could call it an approach. So what yeah. other healthcare fields have, have different specialties? Well, let, let's use what is America's gold standard and look at, at, at medical care medicine. So we have general practitioners and we have nephrologists and cardiologists and neurosurgeons right. and neurologists. So there, you know, chiropractic has that as well in the different techniques. So when we look at what we are taught with when we graduate chiropractic school, we're taught general passive physiotherapies. And we know right. physiotherapy is our term 
where physical therapy is the term of the physical therapist, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, adjustments, what do they do? Well, well, we'll use the word alignment as a synonym for an adjustment or a manipulation, right. but, but does an adjustment, does it change the alignment? Well, right. here's what it does. It, it'll change the alignment for a moment. Uh, maybe a second, maybe a minute, maybe a few days. Right. But if you were to take that and measure that, then you know the effect of the adjustment, the pain killing effect, the nociceptive effect, the increase in the range of motion, uh, you know, tur turning that neuromusculoskeletal system back on, those benefits are there in right. the adjustment. But correcting the alignment, um, we know you've been in, in in clinical practice a long time. The adjustment right. doesn't fix the neck curve, right. so. Chiropractic biophysics comes along and it says the, the ways that we were taught to measure and analyze the spine, they may need to be updated. They may need to follow right. current mechanical engineering and mathematical models. So, so this approach, what it did was it, it first looked at, is there a normal? Right. And, and then it published that in, in really respectable journals. And then it looked at, is there, is there a range, because nothing's perfect, uh, right. of outside a normal? And then if you're outside of this normal, what happens to the spine? Well, it, it's, the, it's the Wolf's Law. It's the degenerative processes. So, right. so if we know there's a normal, we know there's an abnormal, then is there something you can do that can change that abnormal back to normal? Well, the adjustment moment we published wasn't long enough. Right. Right. So that's like saying my teeth are out of alignment. Mm -hmm. Okay, now they're fixed. Mm-hmm. And, and nobody would find that to be true or logical, right? Well, I think that's a great point you bring up there, too, because we know, let's say if someone's getting braces and they don't have them on for the period of time necessary for the actual long-term change to happen, you take them off too early, what happens? The teeth misalign again. They go back into that, that, that position of dysfunction that's like the normal for that person, but it's not the optimal function. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and so then, then if you said, well, okay, if, if that moment isn't long enough, then you would say, well, what about exercise? Like, like let's talk about what we did in the gym back in, yeah. in our chiropractic school. Right. Day. You know, <laughs> did we need to work more back and, and work the upper cross syndrome? Can working a muscle change alignment? Well, we, we did some studies on it and it didn't. Not, not in a large enough sample size in a repeatable long enough duration fashion. So that's like saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to change the alignment of my teeth. And I, I don't know any orthodontists that do that and they don't do it likely because it doesn't work, but braces right. work, as you said. So chiropractic biophysics then developed a, a combination approach, a synergy of approaches, which is adjusting the patient, their posture and their spinal alignment in the mirror image where they should yeah. be doing braces, which we call two and three point bending traction in the vector where the spine needs to go and then coupling it with mirror image exercises. Right. And this is, a, this is a, a prequel to what typical physical therapy would do, functional physical therapy. This is a structural approach. So, so they work together logically. You can, use, you can use treatments like chiropractic to address a symptomology. Right. And then you can move into a structural uh, protocol if clinically indicated. And then from there, you can move into a functional protocol if clinically indicated before a patient gets into being, you know, better or in a wellness type of plan. That, that's a real down and dirty of what chiropractic biophysics is a specialty is and does and did. That's, that's awesome. That's such a great approach, you know, because it answers a question so many people have is like, well, wh where's my long term results? Why is it that, you know, like you said, you felt great, but yet the alignment still looked the same later. I think it's really important for people to understand even is just the development of their curves in the spine and how important posture and alignment is even to their, their health. I know what they're talking with Detis, you know, when we were going through his uh, uh, function neurology programs, he talks about how that's even a marker of your neurological development and also how, how healthy your brain is too, that you look at when we're an infant, we start off, we don't really have our curves. We're kind of in that fetal position. And as the brain starts to develop, then we start to get our extensor muscles and our curves are coming in that direction. And then as we neurodegenerate, what happens when we're older? People think it's just the bones collapsing, but it's also this whole feedback loop of the brain talking to the, to the muscles, to the nerves, to the proprioceptive fibers, letting you know where you are in space, start to break down, the person starts to go forward. So if you can talk to the people watching, how, just how important is proper alignment, proper curves, what can happen when they aren't addressed and they aren't taken care of? 
Well, I mean, it's, it's a great point. We talked earlier about, about where we got into the, into the study agenda with chiropractic biophysics of what happens if you're outside of a range of normal. Right. So we, we see Wolf's Law. We see abnormal deterioration of those bones and joints. So, okay, so what? But then as that bone spur develops, if it grows into the central canal or the foramens and right. any sort of impingement, even, even a, a chemical impingement upon those right. nerves, and what does that do to your, to your function, your neurophysiology? So the, there's a, a really interesting RCT that's come out within the last year that looked at, at forward head posture yeah. combined with lack of neck curve and uh, sensory motor, res, motor response time. Yep. The paper, in, in, in essence, it found that if you restore normal alignment, uh, forward head posture and neck curve, that it would improve sensory motor function by about 10%. Now, what it, cool. what's, what's 10% do, right? Yep. 10%, my, my immediate reaction uh, for, for a, a real world application is military and sports. Absolutely. Yeah, sports performance. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you bring up a great one there, too, for the people who don't know what forward head carriage is, is you think about people that are working in a, um, a job or on a computer all the time or just kids these days constantly texting and you're constantly on social media and looking forward. And you got all these muscles tightened up here. The head uh, carriage comes forward. You got a pre-existing, say, an auto accident that gave you a straight spine. Now you can look at things like where you've got carpal tunnel syndrome ulnar tunnel syndrome, you know, all different kinds of neurological syndromes that when you look at the traditional methods to address these, especially with carpal tunnel, they're looking just here and completely ignoring what's going on with the neck, where the nerves are exiting, how the brachial plexus is being, you know, having pressure on along that whole system. So I think what you're doing is you're looking at really that whole picture, not just that symptomatic area, correct? Yeah, that's exactly it. Because we want to look at the whole body. Um, for for example, what if a patient came in with low back pain? Uh, yeah. You know, obviously a chiropractic physician would examine the low back, but would you examine the middle back or the neck? Um, yeah. you, you know, knowing your anatomy and and knowing the clinical application, we've all seen that that patient that didn't really have abnormal findings when we tested them in the low back, even though that's where their symptom was, and we yeah. found the problem generating from the neck. Right, 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 exactly. I mean, how many times you hear of people, that's one of the reasons why I title this of, uh, you know, non-surgical solutions for chronic back pain and scoliosis is that people will go in and everything is corrected surgically, but there's still an extreme amount of pain because they're looking through that little that little pinhole at, at thinking, that, okay, this is the only area. It's kind of like a car mechanic. Like if you took your car to a mechanic, and I, they say, I'm the carburetor guy. And they only look at a carburetor or they only look at pistons or something. It's like, no, 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 the engine, you got to look at everything and, and figure out how to address that. So let's say, for example, with somebody who's got these abnormal curves or like, I know I recently sent you a patient with scoliosis, um, you know, because I've been managing her for a long time with just adjustments and for, symptomatically. But I told her, you need to do something long term to think about how to correct these um, abnormal curvatures here. Otherwise, let's talk about with scoliosis. What happens when you allow that to progress? What happens to the person's organs and immune system, et cetera? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. I'll give you, a, I'll give you an extreme example. We had a 12-year-old young lady that was brought in by, um, by her parents. She'd been seeing her, her general chiropractor where they did their primary health care with, with, with a classmate of ours. Yeah. Um, Posturally, the findings were, were pretty unremarkable, except that she had an unusually short torso. Um, functionally, there were, there were you know, some seasonal allergies, but, but nothing real serious, no pain whatsoever. She was active, she was playing soccer, but the, the general chiropractor had an intuition that something was off. Well, we'll, typically, we'll, we'll quite typically take x-rays of patients uh, prior to doing a thrust on a spine, we want to understand what we're looking at and what we're thrusting into. And, and some of the orthopedic and neurological tests were off. Well, it turned out she had a 90 degree thoracolumbar scoliosis and 110 wow. degree lumbar scoliosis. Wow. Um, when I showed our class. As a reference to Jason, as a reference, what would be like, say, a mild case compared to that? What would be a degree? Great question. So, so depending on the literature you look at, you have a, you can be diagnosed as scoliosis if you have anywhere between ten and fifteen degrees of curvature looking at the spine from the frontal plane. Yeah, so really at nine to twelve times, what would be uh, mild? 
certainly classified as severe. And then here's another interesting point. When you talk to an orthopedic or a neurosurgeon that specializes in scoliosis, they're, they're considering surgery at anywhere from a 45 degree right. on a low mm -hmm. end to about a 60 degree. At, right. at that point, basically, they're saying it, it, it's time to operate, right? Yeah. So we were, we, were doubling, we were doubling what we would call a severe case already yeah. at, at 90 and 110 degrees. Here's the, the interesting thing. So, so we ordered full spine MRIs. We get the patient referred over to a neurosurgeon right away. And then the parents said uh, to the neurosurgeon, what are we really worried about here? Because they're, they're thinking our daughter's fine. Yeah. And, and they said, well, she's the, playing soccer. You said, right? Functionally, yeah. she's fine, right? right. And, and all they see is this kind of short torso. Yeah. So, so the, the big worry that the, that the neurosurgeon said is I, I'm pretty concerned the aorta is going to pull off of the heart. Right. Wow. wow. Big deal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So now what are, what are we doing in that sense? So what would a general chiropractor do in co-managing that case? Spinal adjustments would be fantastic as, as a pre-treatment in yeah. preparation before doing the, the, the surgery because it's going to create mobility and flexibility. Right. Chiropractic biophysics would be even better because you're adding in, you've got the adjustments, you've got the, the exercise, and you're doing traction like braces right. on teeth, and you're really increasing the flexibility, which gives the surgeons a better chance of making a bigger reduction surgically. Right, right. And now what kind of results did you get with that particular patient there with her being so, so pronounced? So yeah, that, that patient, we got her down into the 60s. Okay, so, great. so that's interesting. Now, uh, uh, another case that we got, uh, we, we sent the patient over to the surgeon at about 90 degrees. Same thing, we used a traction exercise chiropractic protocol um, simply as preparation for surgery, right? We're co-managing with the surgeon. The surgeon's taking primary. But we right. did a good solid three months of pre-care before the surgery. Surgically, yeah. we got that patient down to 27 degrees. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's a huge reduction. Now, did the patient still have to go in and do the surgery, or uh, what, was it, what, what happened? Yeah, in this, in this 90 degree case where we got that profound reduction down to 27 degrees, that was a surgical reduction. Okay, uh, gotcha. However, we've got many, many cases, and, and, and let me back up, our real success window where we can help the patient avoid the surgery <laughs> yeah. is if we can get you around 45 to 50 degrees or less and we can yeah. get our hands on you, we have a chance that we're going to reduce those angles below the 45 yeah. degree surgical threshold and and we've got tons and tons of cases where we're doing this using things like scoli brace scoli brace was developed by dr jeb mcavini out of sydney australia mm -hmm. doing that as the home intervention a mirror image brace coupled with the in-office chiropractic biophysics that's awesome and i think that's a key point you bring up there too is catching it earlier because so often we see where people don't take action uh, i mean look at our whole healthcare crisis right now what we're going through with the whole COVID thing is a lot of people who thought they were healthy um, and they didn't know they had underlying high levels of inflammation or didn't think that that, you know, blood sugar fluctuation was going to be that much of a problem or having some extra weight was that much of a problem. I think that's an important thing for people to think about going forward is that you need to pay attention to all these different factors of your health. Posture, you think about in generations in the past, they used to teach kids posture, you know, stand up straight, you know, and you practice different kinds of things. And we've really gotten away from a lot of those things and gotten away from that ounce of prevention, you know, being worth a pound of, of cure. And I think that's great. So how would people screen for themselves at home to know, like, let's say if they haven't gone to a doctor, what kind of things would they want to look out? Maybe, you know, look at themselves in a mirror or clothing, any kind of things to let them know they might have something going on with their alignment that it'd probably be a good idea to go in and get checked out even if their function seems good well simplistically so we go back to our school days right over 20 yeah. years ago and and the simple things we were taught in in like our soft tissue classes were you know do a plumb line you look at yeah. somebody from the front as the nose aligned with the sternal notch and with the, with the middle of the pelvis down to about midline of the feet looking at themselves from the side now let, let's say mom needs needs uh, the, the child or vice versa to look at them. Right. But is the ear over the shoulder, is the shoulder squarely over about the middle of the hips and then the side of the knee and the ankle. Today though, today we have amazing things like posture screen. So posture screen, you take an iPhone or an iPad, you download an app um, where 
20, 30, $40 to download the app. I mean, it's nothing. And you do a front and side photograph or a front back side side photograph. And then the app tells you where to put the dots oh, wow. and it gives you a, a reproducible uh, objective report on the analytics of the posture. Um, this is an app that's been studied numerous times by UCLA and wow. found to be accurate and reproducible for posture analysis. That's fantastic. And what, what's that one called? It's called Posture Screen. It's put out by a company called Posture Co. They're based out of Florida. That was developed by Dr. Joe Ferrantelli. I'll tell you that all of our patients uh, get a posture screen assessment by our medical providers on initial exam, but that's not enough because we're doing, we're doing our reevals and right. those monthly reevals, we're double checking the posture as well to objectively assess what type of change we make. That's fa that's fantastic getting those kind of measurements out there, and I imagine it probably gives you a graph or a chart to, to show the patient's project uh, progress over time as well. Yeah, it even so it it shows you the photos. So you've got the pre and post, and you can pre and post over multiple sessions over over whatever duration of time the patient is treating. That's fantastic. Now let's talk about um, how does this impact, let's say, an athlete with sports performance? Because we know like, I treat a lot of athletes as well. That's one of my big main things that I do. And we know a lot of times I'll have athletes who come in. And, you know, my thing is lasers. I use lasers to correct different neural. I use them in a neurological method to try to recalibrate the nervous system, etc. But when we're looking at this. So let's say you've got an athlete. How does correcting these alignment issues, these posture issues, how does that translate to performance? Whether it's a let's say it's a sprinter or it's a baseball player or a soccer player or a football player, how can that uh, benef be a benefit to them to really maximize their sports performance? Couple, couple good examples. So I'll go back to the RCT I mentioned uh, um, a few moments ago, the forward head posture and lack of neck curve. Now, you, you cannot assess neck curve without a radiograph. It, it, it's not possible. Uh, you, you, you can't see it with your eye. There is some decent data that you can assess the mid-back curve visually or with some external measurement tools. But if you use an app like Posture Screen or even use that, that visual plumb line of, near, of uh, ear to shoulder, yeah. just if the head comes forward like this, yeah. That'd be a decent indication to go ahead and obtain imaging, right? And I see that a lot with wrestlers. Wrestlers are either fantastic athletes, their endurance is amazing, but their posture universally stinks because they're so into these anterior muscles and everything coming forward that almost all of them have these rounded shoulders and a forward head carriage as well, too. Yeah, they really do. So, so you see that finding visually, right? Whether the patient or the patient's family or loved one sees it, or, or you as, as the sports treating doctor sees it. So then we order a radiograph. Let's assume that with the radiographic findings, we find that anterior head carriage, that forward head, and the lack of neck curve. We talked about, about the 10% improvement in sensory motor function when we get the neck curve and the, and the head realigned. Right. So, so then that makes sense that there's 10% less ability here, right? right. So, so that's, that's a quick and easy assessment yep. that should be applied to all athletes. Now, then we go into, into so many of our sports, how important is arm strength, right? Are you going to lose arm strength and function if your head is forward and there's a lack of neck curve, right? right. Or conversely, the boxer, the basketball player, the baseball football player, are you going to improve that arm strength by having the bony alignment, which is, is visually seen in posture assessment, where it's supposed to be normal? Now, right. let me go the other way. Use the posture app that I explained, uh, for example, and let's say that it appears with the posture screen app that the pelvis is unlevel or maybe there's one leg is, is anatomically shorter than the other. Right. So if you see that indication, then go ahead and measure it radiographically. We were treating uh, Jamaican and American Olympic track athletes for a while. We found an interestingly high incidence of left leg shortness in all the track athletes. Going around. Going around the track, right? And all the time, too. It's amazing. They go in that same direction all the time. Yeah. And you see that whole distortion. Yeah. So think about this now, the, the, you're talking Olympic athletes, right? So you're right. talking kids that have been running track since yep. they were kids, growth plates open, Huter Volkman. So Huter yeah. Volkman law on long bone, your body is leaning more to the left side, stunting the growth of the left femur or the left tibia. Right. So, so our secret trick was that we put a heel lift or proper orthotics uh, in both shoes, but we're lifting the left side and we balanced out that femur or that tibial length 
and right. we're shaving fractions of time off their track time. And fractions is huge. Fractions of time is a difference between a gold medal to a silver or bronze or not placing. When you look at the difference between that, like when I was playing college football and I ran about a 4 six forty. And my roommate and teammate, he ran a 4.3, almost sub 4.340. Now, it doesn't sound, when you, when you hear three tenths of a second, that doesn't sound like that much until you're running next to somebody who does that. And literally, we're one in the 40 yard dash. He smoked me by 10 yards. <laughs> you know, and I felt like I was completely slow. And so when we look at this, I've had the same experience with some of my runners that I work with to where you start doing these things on them and boom, they're running a faster time than they ever had before. And when you get 10% improvement, if let's say you got a pitcher and if you can get 10% more velocity on that ball or have it to where there's 10% less stress on their arm where they're throwing they're less likely to also develop some of the chronic injuries you know Tommy John rotator cuff injuries etc yeah 100% now now here's an interesting one do this with me yeah sit up sit up nice and straight and mm -hmm. then take a nice deep breath through your nose, at home do this mouth. as well too yeah let's do this Okay, get a feel for the breath you got. Now, put your nose as close to the screen as you can, far as you can, and then breathe in again. Did that affect your vital lung capacity? Yeah, that's a huge difference. You just feel like you're having to work a lot harder and you can't get as much in. So, so if you're that athlete that has the forward head posture, are you gonna have the endurance compared to the guy whose head and neck alignment are, are in alignment? I, right. I, I'm going to tell you, anybody that just did that on the, on the, on the screen with us, that's proof enough, right? It is. <laughs> right? Definitely. Definitely. Proof enough. And we, hey, we have a question here, too, from one person, uh, Jason. See if you can address this from your point of it. So we have one patient who said that her knee and finger joints have been killing her. She can't even paint anymore, which she did often. And every time she bikes, both of her knees hurt so bad. Uh, are there any exercises she can do or anything she can do? What would your recommendations be in a case like that? Yeah. So, so first of all, let's get you in, let's get you having a proper examination and let, let's be right. analytic about it. Exactly. Uh, a lot of times what, what we as the general public look for is what's that quick magic thing to do or not do. And the truth is, is that we're all individuals. And we've got different findings. So let's get a proper orthopedic and neurologic test. Is it your knees or is it coming from your low back? Right. Uh, do you have rheumatoid arthritis or exactly. Good point. do we have a degenerative disc in your neck that's causing a symptomology in your hands? Right. right. So, so let's get proper objective analytics and then let's talk through a treatment plan. Right. It, it could right. be a lot of different things. Uh, it could be supplementation. Um, right. It could be alignment. It could be something where we need to add either exercise or adjustments in. But but those are some some simple generic things that it could be that we would look at doing once we had the data. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I love that you did a patient based approach there and not a um, not a modality based one there because you know you could easily just go into your favorite modality of chiropractic biophysics i could go into mine of lasers but it's important for us also to step back for a second and let's look at well, what could this be there's a lot of different things in there what's the family history is there autoimmunity is there arthritis perhaps you get some labs in there it kind of depends and then from there you can formulate that plan and also see who else do we also work with on this thing like do we you know what are the other specialists that we co-manage with and i think I had Dr. Scringe on here last week and we were talking about that on the future of healthcare is really this integrative model to where instead of us being enemies, it's been really foolishness to where chiropractors are enemies with physical therapists, and enemies with medical doctors and medical doctors, are enemies with us, et cetera. Everybody's like trying to pee on their own territory and it's the patient that gets bounced around and neglected when we really should, let, let's understand like we don't, you and I don't have to know everything that a medical doctor knows or a physical therapist knows. But we also need to know, well, we know this amount and then who can we send you to when it's beyond our pay grade or whatever, kind of like me with my patient sending you when her scoliosis was to a level that I did told her, Hey, I can't help you with this. You need to see the expert on there. I think that's an important thing to work as a work as a team together, look at, you know, what all is going on. And I think too, anytime we got any issue, like as you mentioned back surgeries earlier, one thing that's often overlooked is what are those cofactors? Is there inflammation? Is there, are there antibodies like rheumatoid arthritis antibodies? Um, do they have supplemental needs? Is there low vitamin D, low omega-3 levels, high levels of inflammation, et cetera? It's really important to address there. 
Yeah. And you know, as we get into the nutritional wheelhouse, and I know you had Dr. Detis on, but, yeah. but paying attention to our micronutrients, yes. and, and you know, where does disease develop from, right? At, at some point, the food we're eating and the nutrients we're getting um, cause the beginnings of a process that go unnoticed. Yes. And for many, many Americans, by the time they notice it, it's been progressing for so, so long, whether they didn't feel it or they ignored it. So yeah, D3, you know, right now with COVID going on, I've right. taken 10,000 IUs of D3 every single day. I want my immune system really, really strong. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, you, you think about that, you look at the inflammation factors too, that a lot of people don't know they have inflammation. I've had patients come in, bring in their lab tests to me and say, hey, doc, can you take a look at this? They said this was normal. And I'll see a, a sediment rate, sedimentation rate that is like in the 30s when that should be optimally under 10. And most, most labs will say under 15, maybe 20. And I said, well, what did your doctor say about this? Oh, he says, no big deal, just a little inflammation. But we know that if you've got that inflammation, it's going to ramp up your pain. If you happen to get exposed to COVID, that could be a big factor to trigger a cytokine storm. Let's say you've already got bad posture too, to where your lung volume is not optimal because you've got that forward head carriage. Now that's a factor for you getting that oxygen into the lungs as well too. Correct? Yeah, it, it, whole body. That's the thing right there. You nailed yeah. it. And, and looking at all these systems. I've got a great question for you too. This comes in from Carmen. Hey, Carmen, nice to see you. Um, so her question is this, what's the recommendation for years of chronic neck and lower back pain and the reveals, reveal, the MRIs reveal nothing more than small disc herniations. Nothing's pushing on the nerve or anything. You've got a history of like auto accidents, et cetera, on there. And uh, you know, they're saying, well, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. So in a case like, like hers, Obviously, you're going to do a workup. What could, say, the chiropractic biophysics approach do for somebody like that um, where you don't have these major findings on an MRI? Yeah, so, so based on the MRI findings, uh, this is great. This is very, very hopeful for me. And this chronic neck pain case, what we're going to do is we're going to get the patient in and do a standard chiropractic orthopedic and neurological workup. We're going to do the posture screen analysis so we can assess right front and side of the posture and look at where the head is in relation to the body and the pelvis and the feet. Uh, in, in all likelihood, because of the chronicity of the neck pain and the duration, we're gonna take x-rays. And, and I wanna go back to something on the x-rays. The pain's here, however, th this part of the spine sits on this part of the spine, and, and then if you could see my low back, yeah. right? The spine's one structure, just like the heart's one structure. I'm not going to look at just a right atrium if I'm looking at a heart issue. I'm going to look at the heart. So I would look at the entire spine and look how the whole body mechanics are working collectively. Let's say that because of this case that she has a lack of neck curve. Yeah. Uh, we would start off on a treatment plan of, of general chiropractic and start some general exercise movements to get that pain calmed down and then move into a two and three point bending corrective traction setup to restore that neck curve, couple it with exercise and the mirror image adjustments different than right. standard adjustments and then reassess our work after about eight to 12 weeks. Right. And that's a key thing too. Eight to 12 weeks you're talking about too, is you're talking about a time frame because Obviously, if this has been there for a long time, it's going to take time to correct that, right? It, it, it may. So, so yeah. here's the thing. First of all, in general chiropractic or, or, or general health care, we're doing reevals about once a month. That's right. assessing pain and function. So I'm going to still do that. But from a structural standpoint, it's going to be about 8 to 12 weeks. Now, right. here, here's my guidelines and then what some of the literature says. My guideline, if you're an acute case, let's say that you were an auto injury and that we can equate that damage to the neck curve to this new acute injury, I might do four weeks of care. And we will typically see that correction improve pain, function, activities of daily life and neck curve in that short duration of time. In right. a chronic case, the literature says about eight to 12 weeks will make about a 25 to 50% correction towards normal. But eight to 12 weeks lets us see, do we need to do this anymore? Or right. is there a need to do more care? And then you talk that through the patient with the patient right. so they make that informed choice. Fantastic. Now, let's say if you've got a patient who's got like diabetes or some kind of complicating factors with that, what do you do to ad addressing that as far as in your treatment plan or any kind of dietary protocols you have them do while they're also going through your CVP protocols? 
You know, so nutrition is really important to me and near and dear to my heart. I, we go back to those days when, when you and I and our friends yes. were in the gym, right? We, yeah, we spent so many, we spent almost as many hours in the gym per day in there lifting weights and then going and playing basketball or football or other stuff's out there. And we were all, we'd always be talking about different supplements, diets, we were all guinea pigging ourselves wow. on, on everything. I remember even, you know, doing some of the supplements that are now banned because we thought they were okay at that time. hundred percent, a hundred percent. I know. That's so a diabetic so patient, that, yeah. we, we want to look at their nutrition. You know, we may, we may do things like recommending a ketogenic diet. There's some yeah. interesting mm -hmm. data out there on intermittent fasting. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, collaborating with, with their endocrinologist that they're already with or get them into, into a chiropractic doctor whose subspecialty is nutrition, right? Yeah. Uh, how about laser treatment on the feet absolutely. for neuropathy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love stacking all those things together. I, I like to also, when I'm looking at these nutritional protocols, I like to get some labs on them too to see what are they reacting to. I got one of the ones I, I learned this from Dr. Datis Karaji and his Cyrex labs. They have those great tests to where then you can really see what are they reacting to. Like I had one patient who came in to see me he was one of the top uh, running backs in the nation one of the top high school running backs and then he got a scholarship and he came back to see me his freshman year in college and he had come down with rheumatoid arthritis and he said no one in my family's had this except for my grandmother who's like 80 some years old what do you think's going on can you do you know can you do laser I heard about you from you know from, from my teammates about laser and I said well yeah we can do laser but uh, when you got rheumatoid arthritis, you got an autoimmune condition. We need to see what's driving the bus. What are some of the factors? So we ran labs with that kid. We ran a um, run these uh, Cyrex tests to see what he's reacted to. He was reacted to whey protein, and he's reacted to rice, and those were and also to gluten. And those were all ramping up his autoimmunity. So here's where if I was doing just laser on this kid while I'm putting out you know, a fire on one end, when he goes home and eats rice and takes his whey protein shake, he's pouring gasoline all over it. And you know, what athlete isn't taking whey protein? And he was loading that up. And then his ethnic background was he was like Creole, uh, Mexican and Asian were three of his backgrounds there. So he had like red beans and rice, Spanish rice, and you know, uh, white rice all around there. So everything he was eating on a daily basis was flaring it up. And sometimes people forget about how powerful foods are my example with patients when they come in they're like well a lot of times like well how is my foods related to this i'll ask them do you have pets do you have a dog or a cat and if they do they'll be like yeah i got one well, when you go to the vet what's the first question they usually ask you they're like what are you feeding your pet and if you're feeding some cheap little bargain cat food or dog food they'll say no 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 you got to stop that Here's the, here's the specialty medical food you got to do. Here are the supplements you got to do. And because we love our pets, we'll go and throw down, you know, a ton of money on pet food, you know, $2 a can or something. And then think nothing about it when we go through the dollar menu drive through and not equate that with how you feel physically. And I'm sure yeah. you've seen the same thing, right? Yeah, 100%. Something else interesting comes to mind. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Curtis Fedorchuk and Dr. Doug Lightstone, they practice in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and, and Curtis is somewhere around 20 or 30 papers in the, wow. in the peer-reviewed literature. And Doug, Doug is at five or 10. Um, they, they've done a preliminary study where they were measuring diabetic patients and their, and their glucose levels. And then they'd put a traction load into the lower thoracic thoracolumbar spine, uh, leave that patient in that traction load, going in the vector that the spine should go for about 20 minutes, and then doing a, a glucose test right after that. And they would yes. see drops in the glucose levels. This is early right. data. So, right. you know, qu quoting the famous Dr. Fauci right now, yeah. you know, there's not an RCT on this. So right. we're not saying traction is, is curing diabetes. I want to make sure that's clear. Uh, right, correct. But, but we're studying these things, and, and it's interesting preliminary data that will be studied further. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I've seen that. I know when I do my, I teach some relicensing seminars here in California and I teach about not only laser, but also about what, you know, alignment and manipulation has been shown in different studies there. And I remember I, I read some specific studies showing that changes in like post manipulative therapy can show changes in cortisol levels and insulin levels and glucose levels, et cetera. And we know like, let's go back to your extreme case with those scoliotic patients that when you distort 
the the tissues and you distort an organ, what happens to its function? It starts starts to alter, and you can change the function of these of these organs in a negative way. The extreme example of ripping the aorta off, but when you have minor alterations too, you can get these changes in in function. And when you are correcting or improving alignments, or you're doing uh, tractioning, or even when we're doing laser, there's different studies that have shown its benefits too with um, with changes in blood sugar. Again, there's not a randomized controlled trial on it, but there are some some fascinating research over the last 15, 60 years on these things. Yeah, and it's important to remember, so, so the epitome, uh, the epitome of science is the RCT and really yeah. even the meta-analysis, which mm -hmm. is analysis of multiple randomized control trials. That's, that, right. that's like the gold standard. But to get to the point where you're doing a randomized trial, someone had to have an idea, Right. Maybe vet it clinically, see something after having it happen, right. maybe publish a case study, maybe do a case series, maybe go from, from studying stuff, um, you know, in the past to doing it prospectively. And so right. that's important. You know, yeah. science comes from an observation and, and, you know, with doctors, clinical observation. Yeah. Yeah. And then if they're going to do that RCT, there's a lot of money that's involved in trying to run that study too. That's been in the past, one of the limiting things is trying to get the funding to run some of these. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and, and to that point, I'm gonna make a, a shameless plug. Uh, yeah. I'm one of the plug board away. members for Chiropractic Biophysics Nonprofit. And anybody listening or watching, you can go to C as in Charlie, B as in boy, P as in Paul, nonprofit.com there's a donate button so um, all, of, all of the board members we donate our time and you, all of us usually donate somewhere between a thousand and ten thousand dollars of our own money wow. each year yeah. and, and and anybody that wants to donate to spine research some of the research studies I've been quoting and talking about today you can go there and you can don't donate and and you can help us do more of these studies we have about 250 studies in the literature right now that's fantastic. That's especially as we're trying to move forward and improve healthcare. I think that's that's a wonderful thing that people can do. And with that in mind, too, let's say if we got somebody who's listening, and we got people across the U.S. and internationally that are listening, we got some people tuning in from the U.K. also, uh, also the and, U.K. also uh, Andrea Reyes, Detisa's uh, a significant other. Uh, it says hi, and so does Jason and Sarah. So. Jason, Sarah saying, saying little long bone shafts and long bones. Talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, docs, how are you guys? So anyway, with that, let's say as people are listening, how would they get more information from you or how would they find a doctor who knows how to do chiropractic biophysics? What's, what's their way to go about that? Great. So shifting off of the nonprofit and then we'll go into finding doctors that are trained in our approach. So sure. uh, if you'll go to idealspine.com and then click on patient resource, you're going to see a you're going to see a button that says either do, find a doctor or find a chiropractor, and it will list out a doctor that's taken a course. So if, if there's nobody in your area and all you can get is a is a chiropractic doctor that's taken one course, yeah. okay, that's fine. Ideally, what you want to do is you want to look for a doctor that's either general certified, that's 100 hours of post grad training, advanced certified, 200 hours of post grad training. And then now there's there's a diplomat that's a, a nationally recognized 400 plus hour post grad diplomat um, done through the International Chiropractic Association. Um, the higher levels of training. So you're going to find doctors throughout the United States, Canada, uh, the UK, the world, and you'll see their their levels of training. And um, this is somebody that that doesn't replace your chiropractor. Okay, right? They, they can. But we're, we're a subspecialist where we could work in conjunction with the chiropractor that you already have to, to look at alignment and postural distortions right. and, and, and fix those types of things we've talked about today. Yeah, I think that's a great example that you say there is, you know, uh, and we, there's so many people that need help that if there's a chiropractor out there, don't feel threatened by this, you know, because we all have different specialties. It's like I have friends who are near my office who send me their patients who need laser, you know, and they're fantastic adjusters. They're excellent at what they do, but they know there's certain cases where, Hey, they need something different. Or like I sent you my patient and we talked on the phone about what she's doing and, you know, keep, you're keeping me in the loop and whatnot. And I think the important thing there is focusing on the what's best for the patient is the important thing. And then everything else will follow, you know, you'll be, you'll be successful because they're gonna be happy that you helped them and got them to the right place is a, is a main thing. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a hundred percent right. And and you know, so you know, for for the professionals out there, the patients out there that hear things uh, about this particular approach, to be thorough, we need to take an X-ray. There was a there was a historical fear of taking an X-ray. More and more, you're seeing the literature to show that that plain film radiography just does not pose the risk that it, it was thought to from the equations in the 50s. So sure. uh, it, it's better to be thorough and make informed decisions. Next thing is, is let's say you're my patient. Let's say that we talked through an exam and, and we determined to take x-rays. And then we sat down a day later and went over those, those findings. And we recommended that you did eight weeks of care that included traction and exercise and chiropractic biophysics. That's a choice. You right. may listen to that and say, thank you, no thank you. I, I'd like to do general chiropractic and get these symptoms under control and mm -hmm. then come in as needed. This is, a, this is an important thing that, that maybe is a misconception is thinking that, that people have to do a thing. Um, right. it, it's not true. You, you get no. the data you, and you decide what's best for your health. That's perfect there. I love that too, because especially in our profession, there is a, recu a reputation in the sense of a lot of clinics unfortunately using high pressure types of sales tactics to close a patient on a high uh, on a high ticket case etc and i think it's important that for what you do what we do when you're trying to take an ethical approach you present it of hey this is what i think is the plan that i would recommend for you but ultimately it's up to you i'm not going to pressure you to do it it's not that oh and this deal is only good until you get to the door and once the door is gone that should be a red flag for you if you got somebody telling you these things that it's only good for the next 20 minutes or whatever no no it's there once you're ready like with the patient i sent to you i know i talked to her about you six years ago right recommended her a long time ago and told her listen this will continue to progress we're really just we're just plugging up the holes on the Titanic right now. We're not, you know, really addressing what the big stuff that's going on. But ultimately, it's the it's the patient's decision when they're ready for it, when to commit to what they're going to do. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah. So, Jason, thank you so much for your for your time. It's been a really informative hour. Um, is there anything you want to add here at closing? We have some good questions there. Anything you want to want to add? No, I just, it's been a real pleasure to be on with you and I hope everybody's staying safe. We are, we are enthusiastic and excited about opening back up, seeing the country and the world open back up. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that we gave you some information today on how to find a doctor that specializes in, in what I've specialized in and some information you can apply in your everyday life. Fantastic. And thank you guys so much. This is going to be up on YouTube later on the YouTube channel. You can also find my interviews with Dr. Karazian, Dr. Scringe, all the other specialists that I've been interviewing, trying to get as much information out there as I can. I feel really fortunate and um, God, people use this word so much blessed. I hate kind of saying that word, but really when I look at who came out of that school with us. It is just amazing. You, know, you Dr. Tis Karajian, we got Brad, Brad Glowacki that came out of there, um, you know, Chad Larson, we got just some amazing names, Brett Katz, you know, the PI King pretty much. We were talking about this the other day. It's just amazing how much, and I know I left a ton of people out, but just a lot of really good people that came out of that school. And it was just a, a great time to have been, at, been there in a good environment with a lot, of, a lot of really smart people who were just like yourself, totally approachable, down to earth, and really not an ego. And I, it's one of the great things I admire about you and admire all the work you've been doing, Jason. Well, I, I, can't, I can't say how much I appreciate that. And it was great being on with you. And I'll, I'll look forward to talking to you next time. Awesome. Thank you, Jason.